Welcome to the One Away Show, presented by BW Missions. I am Brian Wish, and I am your host, and thanks so much for being here. On this show, I sit down with compelling entrepreneurs, authors, and rising leaders to talk through their most transformative relationships, experiences, and epiphanies. Curated with entrepreneurial leaders in mind, we'll dig into these finite moments in people's lives and understand how they helped set their path forward. Aaron Grau is the co-founder and COO of Charter, an online media company that is working to transform the workplace and catalyze a new era of dynamic organizations where all workers thrive. Charter does this by bridging research to practice, giving people the tactical playbook for what work can and should be. Aaron has a long and impressive work history. Prior to Charter, Aaron served as the VP of Culture at Away, a travel retail company. Before that, she was the Vice President of Transformation at the New York Times. Even more impressive than her work history is her personal history. At 36, she was diagnosed with breast cancer, completely changed her approach to life or work. Now in remission, she continues to work hard professionally and for her family. Erin, welcome to the One Away Show. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. It's great to meet you or meet you again uh, mm-hmm. and see all the things you're up to, which is uh, pretty pretty interesting. So Erin, what's the one away moment that you would like to share with us today? Gosh, there's so many that I've been reflecting on, but the one I think that really changed the trajectory of my life was being diagnosed with breast cancer in my thirties with a one-year-old and a three-year-old and Mm. no family history. It was just obviously an instant change of perspective for me. Um, There were so many highs and so many lows through my active treatment. Um, I'm in remission now, but it really shaped the kind of mom I want to be, the kind of human I want to be, the kind of work I want to do. Wow. I bet that was extremely hard to process and a uh, mm-hmm. total surprise and mm-hmm. probably did shock, uh, shock the system and kind of put mortality right in front of you. You know, when you got the diagnosis, what was your first reactions? Kind of what, t- tell me about the chain of events that happened after, you know, if you don't mind going there, yeah. whether the family, coworkers, I'm just curious kind of about that moment in time. Yeah. Um, well, it's funny that we're talking today because my the my three year anniversary of being diagnosed is is tomorrow. Um, so this time of year is always really difficult for me, just thinking through the series of events that led up to my diagnosis, and and then shortly after, it was obviously extremely disorienting. I was 36 at the time, and my first thought was like, God, please let me make it to 40. And my 40th birthday is actually in a few weeks. But my, my first thought was like, wow, I can't, I can't, I can't die. I have so much work left to do. I have so much life left to live and I have so much, you know, parenting left to do. And my kids were so young. I was so worried they wouldn't know who I was. And so those are really kind of the things I think about the most, you know, and I just went right into treatment. I, I had a really aggressive form, um, of breast cancer and I, I was diagnosed on August 20th and by August 29th, I started a really intense five month chemo regimen followed by a double mastectomy, 28 rounds of radiation. I did 14 months of a targeted therapy for, I was um, HER2 positive and estrogen positive. And then I had two more surgeries after that. And here I am. (laughs) What a a brave warrior you are for going (laughs) going through all that. Uh, Congrats on, you know, being in remission. Uh, But I'm sure you, I'm sure during that time was learning a sense of resilience and like Mm -hmm. navigating struggle with life flashing before your eyes. From that experience, do any moments stand out or conversations you had with loved ones or insights that just became super clear over you that have changed your, your way of being today? Yeah. I mean, so, so many moments and conversations and also just really a lot of kind of everything changed after that. You know, I think being diagnosed that, that young with such young kids kind of in the prime of my career, I, so first from the family side, 
I made real plans for what was going to happen to my kids and my family if something, um, if it didn't turn out this way and I wasn't in remission, you know? And so thinking through that and what I wanted for my kids and, and our kind of our family's values and our family's mission, something that my husband and I didn't do before, you know, we didn't, we weren't as intentional in our parenting because we thought we had just so much time. So that's mm-hmm. one thing. And so conversations with my husband were really hard and necessary and important. And then in my friends, I, I always say I've never felt so loved as I did when I was in treatment, even after giving birth, you know, after giving birth, a lot of people in my life, you know, stepped up and came to support me and um, like celebrate my new family. But there was something very different about this. I mean, people fed, fed me, cared for me, you know, brought my kids presence. I actually had a group of former colleagues at that point at the New York times that had organized every single, my, my treatment days were on Wednesdays for five months. And every single Wednesday, I received a package from a different group of people um, with a different theme that included, you know, games and books for my kids, you know, water bottles, um, food, slippers, like all kinds of, I mean, blankets, like so many things in so many ways, because so many people just in my life wanted to step up for me and, um, support me. And in the only ways that they knew how, which were, you know, to take care of me and my kids through that period. And so, so yeah, I mean, that, that just changed fundamentally so many relationships that I had, um, the time. And then on the career front, having kids gave me a lot of perspective in my job. So I wasn't, you know, my work had to be really meaningful because it was time I was spending away from them, but my cancer diagnosis really changed that a lot, even more in, and, um, and making sure that the work that I was doing was having an impact and that, that it was not only meaningful to me, but, um, the work that I'm doing because I work in, you know, the workforce transformation space. So was really about creating a better future for my daughters that I hope I'm here to see, but making sure that their workplaces that they inherit are caring and human and, um, and will, you know, take care of them and, and support them in all the things that they want for their lives and their families and their careers. I mean, what a fundamental experience. I mean, I think shaping or reshaping, right? All sides of you and yeah. probably showing you a level, another level of just humanity. People would show up for you in just an entirely new way. Yeah. Uh, if you don't mind me digging deep and pressing on this one, you said that you Please. had um, conversations with your husband that were really hard, that you had to make plans on things you never thought at an earlier stage. What, what were some of those conversations that you were really having to think about? So... One very specific one I remember is I I have two necklaces I wear all the time. One has my kids initials on it. And the conversation I had with my husband was, I want you to save this necklace for um, when you, I hope, get remarried for like the next person who will be a, you know, mother figure, figure to my kids. So um, so yeah, like that's a very specific, really hard conversation. And it sounds so silly, but I think for me, I'm such a planner and having a plan for like, for, for them and for him and for like my things that mean something to me, um, were really important part of my journey. Um, and then in terms of even, you know, thinking about what is important for us, for the kids and what we want. So, you know, I want my kids to, understand that they're like a small part in a really, really big world. And, and we have this rule where we decided, you know, we want the kids, the number of new passport stamps, the number of new countries, our kids visit every year to be higher than their age. So the idea that like travel is so important to them and it's a goal, it's a way to orient us into the things that are really, that really matter in life. And so that they can have all of these perspectives and travel has been such a huge part of my, my life and my husband's life together. And so things like that. Um, and then obviously there's like the practicalities of, you know, a will. And I also wanted to make sure my husband and I share our finances, but I wanted to make sure, you know, my money that I had was earmarked for their college, because if something happened, I wanted to make sure that they knew that their, um, Mm. mother paid for their college. This is so important to me. So things like that. So there's a lot of, um, 
there was a lot, there was a lot of things like that, that were like both practical and important for me. And it was a good thing for me to focus on because also I was like trying to focus on the future. And it was a way that I could like plan, but also focus on the future. Like I think both in my like personal life and my professional life, I'm like constantly staring people organizations, leaders toward the future. And, and that's kind of my orientation too. <laughs> wow. Oh. You're really like, I, <laughs> this is really, um, yeah, it's healing to actually share, but also tough, tough to, to think oh. back in time. <laughs> uh, one, thank you for your vulnerability and being so open. I actually just read the gifts of imperfection this weekend and Brene Brown and it talked about how you heal through the sharing then uh, I'd be creating that type of experience. The thoughtfulness, right? And the deliberateness, right? And the forethought you gave to if and when you had to set up a life for your daughters where like they knew like you you were always with them, like yeah. how special and also intentional. And I'm sure while in- incredibly hard, you, know, you look back and it was like, I mean, it's such meaningful decisions that you know conversations that were had so you know yeah. thank thanks for sharing them with a stranger so this oh, well, uh, thank you special. for holding the space for that yeah thank you <laughs> oh of course and i want to get into and i want to definitely talk about your work and all the things you're up to and and how it's changed that but i also want to talk about you know you've talked about how it it changed you as a mom and how you spent family time right and yeah. in this day and age where like and kids need that attention and they need that development. Um, how do you think without, right, without the diagnosis, mm-hmm. um, how do you think you would have parented differently or made time differently versus this might have shocked you into awareness or consciousness in a new yeah. way? And like, I'm sure you, life, you know, is at the forefront every day for you and it makes you yeah. make certain decisions differently. So I'm just curious, like what, what it means to you to be a parent and what that looks like so you can show up for your family in a way that you would have never had until it was, you know, too far down the path. I'm just, yeah. I'm just curious. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's so hard to answer because my kids were so young when I was diagnosed. And so in a lot of ways, especially for my one-year-old, like this is really kind of the only mom she knows. And so it's really hard to predict what it, what it would have been without this diagnosis. But I will say that one of the the great gifts of that diagnosis and the like really intense few, actually really over a year that followed was that I learned to put my family at the center of gravity for me, like my center of gravity, almost ashamed actually that I didn't know how to do that before, but I, I didn't know how to do that before. I was a really ambitious person. I had really healthy children and a healthy family. And the thing that always seemed to need most of my time and attention and talents was my job and the people who relied on me to do that job really well. And, you know, I took for granted that, you know, I felt like, well, my kids, you know, have great, I have a great village, you know, for my kids, like my kids, I have great babysitters, my kids, I have a great partner. Like I have a twin sister who actually lives a couple of miles away from me. And she's married to my husband's childhood best friend. You know, we just had so many people in their lives. And I'd always told myself like that, that early on, I told myself like, that's what I needed to do. I just like needed to get a village of people, of, of people. I needed to like put them into activities and they were going to learn better from all these other people than like, they're going to learn from me. Like that, that matters, like them going to ballet or soccer, all those things like that mattered. And it mattered who I chose to be with them during the day when I was at work. And I focused on that. And again, like, you know, it wasn't, it just wasn't as intentional. And I think that's probably a shift too, into this just more intentional parenting for me, which is thinking through similar to what we do at work, right? Where I'm like, these are the outcomes I want and these are the paths to get there. And these are the things that I need to do, you know, for my family, for us to have these outcomes. And I didn't think about it that way. I thought like, I have this kid and I'll figure it out. We're figuring it out. This is hard. I'm figuring it out now. And then when I was kind of forced to really think about like what it is I wanted and what I can like, what my husband and I were going to agree my kids were going to get out of this life and what, and like how we were going to set them up for success long-term, like things really changed for us. 
And, and I think for them, and like, like you said, I, it really changed. I, I believe it changed so much about me as a parent and, and really about who they are going to be as humans, like that work. But also I would say, again, like the, they don't know any different then their only memory, their memories will only ever include me having survived breast cancer. They were there when I was first diagnosed, I I was going to lose my hair and I did lose my hair. I had very, very long hair. And I had a party with all of my girlfriends. My mom came up and my kids and, and we hired a hairdresser to my apartment and my kids sat on my lap and we the hairdresser cut my hair and they were so much a part of it. Like when I had my last day of chemo, they came and we had a cake and we celebrated. And like, I think then they were so much, it wasn't a thing that happened away from them. They were, they were so much a part of it. And I'm hopeful that when they look back and think about like resilience and, and like hard things and challenges that you face, I'm hopeful that they remember that really from really, really early on that like they, we can all do hard things as Glennon Doyle says. And, um, and it's actually so much a part, like they've had to do hard things from the very, very beginning. Like watching their mom go through that is really hard. Like, and they don't fully understand it. And who knows what they'll understand later. But um, anyway, I know that's a lot, but those are kind of all the things that came to my oh. mind when you asked. Yeah. Uh, again, what <laughs> what beautiful memories. And I mean, also probably really cherishing moments to like talk to your kids when they're older and, and like share those lessons with them and you know one they may not remember fully but yeah. I'm sure they'll remember the words and they'll you know what you teach them and super special and then also on you said something how you made like family your center of gravity and like we're super intentional I have one more question on this and then we'll shift to please you know, no this is great oh, whatever you want to know I'm work. open uh, book yeah so there was a person in my life who was like very special to me and I remember him telling me that he was so intentional with his kids because of his parents. When I say intentional with his kids, like very present with taking a very active role in their life uh, because of how he grew up. Because his parents were, maybe he didn't show the example. He was also like the first man that I saw that I think was very complete, like as a family figure, but then also Mm -hmm. like was a creative entrepreneur and he could like balance the two yet it was one whole person. It was just, he was extremely special. And um, so my, my question to you is like, you say you like, you only, your kids will only know what like they saw growing up. You, it sounds like your lean early was like career and ambition. Like what, what was your model for your own life growing up that maybe influenced work being such a high priority versus intentional presence at home? Yeah. Well, funny enough, my dad was in the military for his whole career and my mom was largely a stay-at-home mom. She ended up going back to school and eventually got a master's in anthropology when I was in high school. But so, so, you know, growing up when I look at workplaces, like these are not the models I grew up with. You know, I learned obviously a lot. My, my mom was an incredible present mom and my dad was like such a hard worker. And so, you know, hungry for learning new things. So I learned a lot from them, but not necessarily as like models for, of what I would adopt as my ambitious grown up self. Mm. I, I feel like there is a huge problem for the women in my generation that we're told that you can have it all and, and, and actually to, to, to have it all, like it's kind of on you to get it all. (laughs) And also related to parenthood, I was talking to actually recently, um, you know, activist and author and founder of Marshall Plan for Moms, Reshmish Sojani, uh, also the founder of Girls Who Code, just two weeks ago. And we were having this conversation and we were talking about how, again, this like, you know, corporate feminism and how it just like hasn't served us well. And, And for moms, like, you know, there aren't people demanding change for working mothers in the workplace. The nine to five does not work for caregivers. Like doesn't align with school schedules. Like it's not, it's not optimal to be working so many hours while your kids are awake (laughs) Um, and then having to have a second shift. So like, but, but we were kind of taught a long time ago that like motherhood is a choice and it's your choice. And if you want things to be better, it's on you to make them better. And so Anyway, all of that to say that, like, I actually think I took that into my career thinking, like, I have to outwork everybody. 
have to outwork everybody. I have to get to the top as quickly as I can to prove that I am, I don't know, prove myself. And I got a lot of value Perfect. from saying like, you know, I am this title, like a VP or a COO and I work for this company or I work in, you know, startups or I work at a big media organization. And so I think that was like socialized more than it was taught in my home. You know, I was like socialized to believe that that's what I needed to do. And and I'm like now, you know, related to my diagnosis, but also like related to becoming a parent and, and also like getting to my forties and thinking like, well, what is the rest of my life going to look like? And how do I design a life that makes me happy and fulfilled versus designing a life around a job that I have. So I'm, I'm like slowly trying to do that work. And it's so, it's like so, so, so deeply cultural and it's, it's not easy to do, but that's kind of my journey with, uh, and struggle with totally. ambition. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, good on you for like recognizing it. It's like, you have to like let go of in the old self to like come into a new shell and yeah totally that's well uh, that's hard that's hard emotional work no doubt mm-hmm. so let's I think that's a nice segue into kind of where you are today with career and, and what you're up yeah. to and how it's probably shaped your decisions and, and things that you started on um yeah maybe tell us for the audience a bit about your prior career history with the times and the things you were doing there but then like how that shaped in your next decisions to what you're doing today? Yeah. So I spent most of my career in media. I was, you know, at NBC and News Corp and I spent seven years at the New York Times. I was, my last role there was um, vice president of transformation. It was a new role in the operations group. I reported into the now CEO, Meredith Levian, who's just brilliant and wise and wonderful. And it was really about modernizing a 160 plus year old institution. And that includes systems and leaders and talent and, um, and culture. And so I got to work on a lot of really cool projects when I was there. And then I really wanted to try to innovate into white space. You know, I was innovating against incredible market pressures, you know, at the times is kind of, kind of the work we were doing. And I wanted to really try something new. And so I went to a startup. I went to Away, which is a luggage travel startup. I worked there for, you know, over two years and ran a lot of business ops functions. I started as an organizational development VP of org dev. And then I ran, you know, people and culture and then also process strategic planning, project management, you know, social impact, customer experience. Like I ran a lot of different teams as, as you do at startups. And I I had the full startup experience. And then I went out and did kind of my own work consulting around the intersection of talent and operations, which is really where I I think I work best. And now I am the co-founder and COO of a company called Charter. My other two co-founders, Jay Loft, and Kevin Delaney are also long tenured media execs. And we decided to create this like media and services business focused on the future of work. And I think this job is cool for me personally, because it's at the intersection of that, like Venn diagram of what the world needs, you know, what I'm really passionate about and also what I think I'm good at, or at least have some experience in. Um, And so, you know, having impact that way across multiple organizations and still through media is really fulfilling to me. Um, so yeah, we do a ton of work. Um, we have, you know, this newsletter, we have, you know, a website, we create a lot of content, we create playbooks. We're really surfacing beliefs and priorities around the future of work. What a time to be at the future of work, right. With the pandemic, but also like, like you said, you've taken all these experiences perhaps put them under one roof in a way and probably bringing the networks and your abilities with these other leaders and, and the team to really create something super meaningful. Right. And I believe you said something like, I hope my daughters like see this in the workforce. Like you're creating the change that you want to see maybe unfold over the next 20, 30, 40, 50, you know, hundred, hopefully next few centuries. Right. So um, how, exactly right. How, how neat. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think it's, and it's, you know, work is changing so much. And I, and 
the pandemic actually just exposed the unmet needs of so many people. But like I said earlier, you know, the nine to five does not work for so, so, so many employees in this country. And our lives are more intertwined with work than ever before. Work is totally outdated. Businesses don't know how to manage people. So how can managers be expected to know how to manage people? And then on top of that, there's so much pressure on the private sector right now to step up and lead in things like caregiving and mental health and you know racial injustice because so many institutions have failed the American people. And so now is such a great time to get into this work for us to just have such a greater in, like impact and also to, to add like capability and capacity to so many organizational leaders who have so much work to do to steer their company towards the future. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, what a time on all fronts. And mm-hmm. good though, you know, it's good though, mental health are being exposed. Something I want to ask you, and you can answer in those realms, but I would say even more precise for the bucket of caregiving leaders like yourself who are caregivers to, to kids or women in business um, mm-hmm. or not or all walks of right their career. What would you say as you look you know, at the trend of the future of work, if you could see three changes maybe come to fruition mm-hmm. or one, right? I mean, yeah. where, where do you, where would you, when it's, let's just say you look back at the legacy of your work, so to speak, mm-hmm. where do you hope, those changes have been enabled across the line for hopefully millions? So such a good question. I mean, kind of focusing on caregivers for a minute, you know, almost two and a half million moms dropped out of the workforce in the last 18 months. And I think the tide rises all boats. And so doing work for caregivers for example, is actually work that's going to benefit everybody. So let's take the nine to five. How do you create more flexible schedules? How do you do that more deliberately across your organization? So I think I think rigidity of work is gone. Flexibility is here to stay. I think that looks like a lot of asynchronous work. So you can say, you know, asynchronous work, and then also making sure that you're shoring up your internal practices so that uh, you're not letting proximity bias, for example, um, or visibility bias show up in performance reviews, for example, because it's one thing to give people flexibility. It's another thing to penalize them if they take that option, which we know based on the data that we have right now, we know more caregivers and more people of color for, di- for different reasons are more likely to want flexible or remote heavy schedules. So like, so flexibility, one really big piece. Um, Also, you know, this is kind of a little bit funny to say, but I actually think the the way we think about benefits are really outdated. So the fact that one person in your organization basically designs the benefits that work for everybody, but, but again, in that flexibility theme, like it's not one size fits all anymore. So Dropbox just, they announced, you know, $7,000 and employees can kind of choose it's an allowance. They can choose their own benefits. So like if you need more caregiving or, you know, whatever it is and I, or, you know, work from home setup. And I think that is a future of work thing. Um, like that, I think we're going to see more of that. If just like that, just greater flexibility across many dimensions. The four day work week is also really interesting to me. I think related to what I was saying, but the, the nine to five that like, we're kind of breaking the mold of the nine to five also what that could look like is that you are, you know, working in different ways so that you're actually focused on work four days a week and then three days a a week that you are taking a longer break. And that doesn't, you know, I think figuring out the hours, I'm not suggesting you do 10 hours a day. Um, that's now like nine to seven or whatever, but I think figuring out what that looks like so that your employees are focusing on work within four days of a week, (laughs) then five days of a week, I think is also a trend. And there's data, you know, out of New Zealand and Iceland that this is really working for a lot of organizations and they're not seeing, you know, dip in productivity and actually in some cases seeing uh, an increase in productivity. And so, yeah, I think that's another trend and related is, is more autonomy. So again, we like, we talked about flexibility, but it means a lot of different things. And I'm kind of sharing a lot of different examples of how I think it's going to show up, but greater autonomy over your, your work is going to be really important. And I think we're going to see a lot more of that, um, also in the future. Yeah, no, I, I've definitely heard about the four day where it's, you know, Margie on our team who runs our content division. She brought it up on our team call a few weeks ago and 
I was like, it took me a minute to um, digest. And then I started reading the articles and I was like, oh, this might make a little more sense. But it was like, it was, you know, it's a very forward thinking initiative, right? And it's neat that you're at the forefront so you could see the ripple effects and how that could, you know, be brought to maybe a Western society in the U.S., with your work at Charter specifically too, which I think is just interesting. And just going back to the original kind of moment of being diagnosed, like this is so fundamental because if done right, it's going to allow you to have more time with your family and be intentional and have your daughters have the life that you always wanted. So with Charter, like what, how are you guys going about, you know, I know you mentioned different areas, but I'm just curious um, to kind of wrap up here on the last question. Like what specifically are you doing like what's a model, what's the model kind of look like so you can go and help be a part of these changes and how do you measure those changes that are made, you know, if you thought about that far out as well? Yeah, well, these are all good questions that are we're trying to sort out through in our business plan. <laughs> but no, but seriously, like I think, um, you know, we believe deeply in the power of media to have a huge impact and helping to surface insights and research-based best practices. And so that's one thing, like we, what we do is we bridge research to practice. So some people, you know, report on kind of the trends or what some people are doing, but we really try to make it real for leaders and organizations, both through our content and through the, you know, tools and resources that we offer, but also in working with organizations. And then also, you know, we advise companies. And so, around transformation, workplace transformation and what that looks like. And so there are a few different steps on that path and and helping them diagnose where they are and where they want to be and helping connect today to that future. And so that takes shape and there's a lot of different ways um, that comes to life depending on the organization. But it is, I would say like a lot of work, a lot of training and a lot of introducing new skills and mindsets for leaders. It's a lot of communication yeah. And it's, it's still early stages, right? Like we're only a few months old. So we're like trying some things out. Um, we're working with some really cool companies. Um, we have some really incredible members that are, you know, consuming our content and using our content and giving us insights and information and feedback. And then we're, you know, offering more things. And so we're still early days, but it's, coming to life in a lot of different ways. And we'll see. I mean, I think who knows? I mean, I feel like we're the kind of company that, you know, like most startups, they're a new company every few months and we're no different. But right now I think we've found like a pretty, the sweet spot of like media and services, which is a really new model. We get asked all the time, like, well, what, how do you describe your company? And it's like so hard because I, there aren't other companies that are doing the exact same thing. There are companies that, that consult or advise around, um, workplace transformation. There are media companies talking about the future of work, but there are not many companies doing both things. So, so yeah, we'll see. Nice. Well, at the cusp of innovation, and it's so neat. I mean, I'm super excited for you. It seems like you're like really in a spot where you have a team of people who's going to figure it out. You guys are doing something you love and with the experience and the forward thinking to do it. So, thanks for showing up today with just such yeah. transparency. Probably didn't think you were going to dive in like this, but, uh, Hey, I certainly didn't think I was going to cry. Yeah. I certainly wasn't prepared. I didn't bring tissues or anything, but I'm really, it was very therapeutic. And, um, and again, thank you so much for holding the space for conversations like this. It's so important. And, and actually the future of work is going to be more kind and human, and there'll be more space for people to have conversations about their health and their well-being and their personal journeys as well as their professional journeys. And so, um, so thank you. Yeah, absolutely. No, it was, it was enlightening and I learned a lot as well. Um, where, Aaron, if someone wanted to reach out or they uh, heard, you know, they hear this and they're like, wow, that person's great. Like we'd love to connect. <laughs> like where's the best place to find you? Well, our website is charterworks.com. So you can check out what we're doing there. Um, and you can find me on LinkedIn. I don't really have much of a social presence beyond that, but I actually have, I, re- I respond to every DM on LinkedIn of anybody who ever needs support. Um, I get a lot around parental leave. Um, a lot of people ask me questions about parental leave and how to do that at their organization. So there, or just E for Aaron, E at charterworks.com. Awesome. Well, we'll make sure we include that in the notes. And uh, thanks for being here today. And uh, best of luck to you.
Thank you so much for having me. If you enjoyed this episode as much as I did, I hope you leave a review on the platform of your choice and share it with a friend who you think would find it valuable. If you'd like to receive our written newsletter and thought leadership, head on over to bwmissions.com backslash newsletter and subscribe. See you on the next show.